Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you hear us when we pray, thy kingdom come. Through your Holy Spirit, you have made us your children, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We thank you that in our community you have established a Christian congregation in which your word is proclaimed in its fullness and purity, and your sacraments are rightly administered as you instituted them. Above all, we acknowledge your mercy in bringing us into fellowship in our congregations. You have showered on us blessing upon blessing as we come before your throne. We pray continue to bless this church in your goodness and grace. Make the preaching of your word effective. Let our prayers rise before you as incense. Keep alive and active in us the spirit of brotherly love and helpfulness. Stifle in us every improper ambition and sinful pride. Teach us to weep with those who suffer and to rejoice with those who are honored and happy. Build up our church by your word and keep us in the narrow way which leads to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear fellow redeemed, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, the 6th chapter, the 10th verse. Please rise. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. What is the purpose of a mission festival? You might have your own ideas, your own memories of mission festivals you've attended before, your own priorities. But what would God have us do with a mission festival? I like the hymn that we sang at our entrance into this holy place today, Hark the Voice of Jesus Christ. This hymn teaches what Paul tells Christians in this passage from Galatians. God creates opportunity to do good. We should meditate on the verses of that hymn to see what opportunity is available to us in mission work. Can you speak like angels? Can you preach? Like Paul, can you tell the love of Jesus? Can you rouse the wicked? Can you lead the little children? Can you be a watchman? Can you pray? Can you give offerings? Can you hold up the prophet's hands? No one gets to be excluded from this work. Mission Fest is designed to unite us in the work of Missions, that is, the work Jesus commands at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, although you and I might not be in other nations making disciples, or even in places, places in our own nation where churches are just beginning, we are united in the work. Our offerings go to support the work of missionaries. Our prayers support them as well. And our own personal witnessing in our neighborhoods and among our own families and friends add to this work. But I want to call your attention to one word that is common in both that great commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel and our sermon text today. The word, therefore. This word means there is a foundation for the action. There is a starting point, and a reason, and a power, and an authority behind the action. Therefore, points to the answer to the question of why. Why do we do mission work in whatever capacity we do it? What is behind the therefore Jesus said before ascending into heaven? He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The work, therefore, is based on the authority of Jesus. He conquered death by dying and rising again. He obliterated the guilt of sin for all people by suffering for it in our place. The message of this work he did, therefore, brings its blessings to those who hear it in faith. What Jesus commands, therefore, is that those who have this blessing take those blessings and share them with others. And this is rooted in the ministry of word and sacrament, baptizing and teaching. And there's a promise connected with this too, for Jesus concludes by saying, And lo, I am with you always, 
even to the end of the age. The one who has the authority and the power comes along with those who share the word so that it is his power, not yours, which accomplishes his purposes. It's precisely what the prophet Isaiah heard 700 years before. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it, make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The therefore in Galatians is the same authority behind it. The verses before say, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So why do we do good? It's because of the view of eternity. We will reap what we sow. This does not mean works righteousness, because Paul had rejected that idea earlier in this epistle. He said, do you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? What, in fact, does sowing to the Spirit mean? It's about the Word. It's as though Paul were saying, unless you abide in the sound doctrine which you have received from me, it will not do you any good to perform many good works, to endure suffering, etc., why do you do good to anyone? It's not to earn your place in heaven. That's given to you by Jesus. You have it freely already. He has all authority, remember. His word gives you his life. Therefore, you do good. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The goal is soli deo gloria, that God alone receives the glory. When men glorify God in their hearts, it's because they have faith and are saved. You do good so that people may be saved, joining the household of faith and coming to eternal life. Doing good is mission work. But notice another word that's included in this verse. Especially. You hear that word, especially, and you know that something important is coming, something you should pay attention to. Doing good is already important. You know the Ten Commandments and what a tall order that provides. Especially gives a little guidance so that you know where to focus your energies. Notice it doesn't limit the necessity to do good to all. But where do we especially devote our efforts? Especially to those who are of the household of faith. That is, fellow believers. Yes, love one another first. It's the same in all households, all human households. It's important for the father, for instance, to love all his neighbors, but he should love his own family first. Imagine what it would say if that man gave more and better gifts to the children of strangers than to his own children, or more beautiful gifts to other women than to his wife. How many families might be hurt by those whose family members focus their efforts and love on others, and don't show how much their own family is a priority. In the second century, while the church was undergoing persecution all around, a bishop named Tertullian noticed the attitude of the world, and he wrote, It is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. See how they love one another, they say, for they themselves are animated by mutual hatred. How they are ready to, to even to die for one another, they say, for they themselves will sooner put to death. There's something special in the church, where love is shown so strongly. Yes, the church is to be known for loving those in the world, even caring for physical needs, especially in disasters. But the love is greater between and among us. In this chapter of Galatians, St. Paul had given instructions that Christians were to restore fellow Christians who sinned to repentance, were to bear one another's burdens, 
We're to support the work of pastors and teachers among them. And all this work is love within our household, our family. Thinking of the church in terms of the household of faith also changes our perception of both the congregation and mission work. Why do we do mission work again? It's not a marketing campaign because this is not a business. It's a family. You don't graft people into your family by promoting your family with ads on YouTube or billboards. Join the Lilienthal's. We do Friday pizza and movie nights. <laughs> No, if you were trying to bring someone into your family, you would do it by relationship, by love overflowing to them. See, we're not trying to get something from people. We're offering our love, our home, to them. But it's not really our love, is it? For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. In order to share Christ's love with those around you, you must receive it first. You cannot pour from an empty cup, as one older pastor advised this young minister. It's true, for instance, that my sermon preparation will limp along if I have not first received the word through personal devotion. The same goes for private visits. Or Bible study. I can't do the work of a pastor well without myself being rooted in the Word. That's because the work of a pastor is not man's work. It's God's work. He does it from beginning to end. It's His Word for me, in me, and through me. The same goes for you. You aren't really the one doing good. God does it. Think of that well-beloved passage, again, from Ephesians 2. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All of it, grace, faith, works, it's all God's doing. And we know how he does it too. We don't look at the clouds waiting for a sign. We don't meditate in our hearts on what we should do or where we get strength. No, our strength comes from God in His Word. Look at the beginnings of the Christian church and see how their love was generated. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles' Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking the bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. These Christians, after they were baptized, devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the very word of God taught by them, the fellowship, the unity of faith given by the sacraments and expressed by worship, the breaking of the bread, the Lord's Supper, and the prayers, the liturgy structured in an orderly fashion to pray to God and receive his gifts. That's the foundation. In other words, the Christians would go to the divine service. That's where God served them. He gave them his gifts. His forgiveness, life, and salvation in Jesus, whose death pro was proclaimed to them with each communion. A useful illustration was recently shared with me, showing how it is that Christians give the gift of God's love to the world. Think of the shape of an hourglass. In the top, a rich store of treasures are collected. These are God's immeasurable gifts. In the bottom, it's the world. These blessings are funneled through a small opening in the center. The nexus point is the altar. The altar is where God creates a rich reversal in the sacrifice of his son. Altars were where men gave their gifts to God to appease him, to beg him for mercy. But God sacrificed his own son for that purpose. One sacrifice. For all. So now the altar instead becomes the place where God gives his gifts to us. The altar is the focal point of the divine service. Now some may think it's the pulpit. And it's true that the word that's preached is central 
to all that we have here. But there's an unfortunate tradition that comes out of some Reformed churches who deny the power of God's word and sacraments. And that caused the pulpit to become more important than the altar. In fact, everything stems from the altar. That throne of God. We receive in that location the grace and blessing of Jesus. And being thus filled with grace, given freely by our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, who rules all things, we then share those things with the world in the bottom part of that hour left. Think of the parable of the sower and the seed, how he scattered that seed throughout the whole world without any thought for where it landed. When you come to the altar and receive the blessing of your Lord's body and blood, your cup overflows, as the psalmist says. When you go walking about with a cup that's overflowing, it spills out. The blessings spill out all over. The drops fall off into the sides. You can't help but share that rich gift that you have. That's how others are made then to glorify God. God's gifts overflow from you to the world as you depart from the altar. Now notice that as you walk back from the feast, the first people to receive the abundant spill from your cup are your fellow believers, your brothers and sisters in Christ, the other members of this household of faith. The purpose of a mission fest is to unite us in purpose, to share the good news with the world as God gives us opportunity. Out there, look for that opportunity, but come here and be enriched. So that you go with Jesus' purpose, Jesus' authority, Jesus' power, and Jesus' love. It's love for you and for the other members of this household of faith. And it's love for the world. So that you may, and they may, be saved and come to eternal life in Christ. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. Our service continues.